Boom, and it says we're live. What up, what up, what up, what up, people? Yo, y'all already know what time of the week it is. It is Friday night, the dope hour. It is your host, DJ Agony, two-time ATL's hottest DJ, also known as the Doctor of Dope. And yo, if y'all miss Wednesday night, yo, I y'all really gotta go back and rewatch Wednesday night. But in the meantime, I brought another friend with me. I'm just out making friends right now. You know what I'm saying? Like, who can't like DJ Agony? He just goes out and make friends. And then he brings them home and get to hang out with y'all. So, yo, my new friend, tell these folks who you is and what you do, brother. Oh, uh, man. Thank you. First of all, thank you for having me, man. Uh, over 30 years in the music industry, literally started my music career in 1986. So, I've been here for a minute. Mm, 86. Good times, good times, good times, good times. So let me ask you this though. What um what part did you have? Because I mean 86 was that was a pivotal time in music because rap was really really starting to jet set at that time. But what part did you have in? Yeah, you know what was cool about it, man. I, I always tell people I came in when I came into hip hop, I came in on the second wave. I always tell people the first wave of hip hop was uh especially coming up in New York City. Born in Brooklyn, raised in Queens. Okay. But uh, the first wave of hip hop was um, Grandmaster Flash, Melly Mel, um, who else was a uh, uh, Love Buck Starsky. Right. Wave. And I came in on the second wave of Jazzy Jeff and Fresh Prince, Public Enemy, MC Light. I came in on that wave. So it was a blessing to get into the business around that time when things were really starting to take off with hip hop. Indeed. So did you come in as a hip hop artist? Nah, man. You know, I actually came in. My first job actually was working in recording studios as assistant manager uh, up in Manhattan in a studio called Evergreen Recording Studio. Where I had the opportunity to work with uh, some pretty good people such as Yoko Ono and Roy Ayers and Brenda K. Star and a couple other people. So it was real cool. That was my first intro into the music industry. Yeah, Roy Ayers yeah. is dope. Yeah, no doubt, no doubt. Roy Ayers is dope. So, but yeah. um, so you man, you managed in a recording studio, and you said this is your first job, first free job, man. I worked for free from twelve in the afternoon, twelve at night every Sunday for about a good year. Uh, I did everything, man. I answered the phone, I, I cleaned out the garbage can, I cleaned the toilets and the bathroom. So I did a little bit of everything, you know, just just. Trying to get my feet wet. Hey, Dana, what's happening? Dana J in the building. Dana J in the house. Dana J, what's good, brother? And seen seen that name in a minute. You know, it'd be good to see when uh when when old friends come in and meet your new no friends, doubt. man. That's Absolutely. what's happening right there. <laughs> That's what's happening. Yo, Dana J, don't get lost, man. You need to be on um. I got a seat for you. So whenever you're ready to sit down. Uh-oh, um, but yo, and it's crazy that you said that's your first job because I'm gonna be honest, my first job I worked at Toys R Us. Okay, <laughs> man. Most people' first okay. job is 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 flipping burgers or something like that. No, you are running errands for Roy Ayers. <laughs> um, hey, hey, but you know, let, let me let me back up. That was my first musical job because my first real job was actually working for Social Security office. But that was working in the studios was my first music job, but no pay. Did it for free. Oh wow! So what yeah. we would call nowadays an intern. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what's up, though. But I mean, and and so, what drove you to that, though? You know, man, I I, I had got I had got fed up with doing a lot of the corporate stuff, and came home on, at a crossroad in my life after getting fired from my second second corporate job, and um, I was sitting home watching the American Music Awards, and Prince was performing. And I remember thinking to myself, man, he looked like he's having a lot of fun. Plus, he's getting paid to do this. That's what I want to do. I want to be in the music industry. I want to do something where I can have fun and get paid to have fun. And that was my journey into the music industry. Wow, wow. So in getting into the industry, though, what made you lean more toward being behind the scenes versus being in front of the camera? Oh, man, keep it real. I knew I couldn't say it. I was like, I know I can't sing, so what else? You know what? I want to be an audio engineer. I want to push the little colored buttons 
and have the celebrity music artists in the booth and I'm giving them directions. And I just started calling all these recording studios in Manhattan, like trying to get put on. I was asking them, hey, can I work for free? A lot of them hung up on me. A lot of them laughed at me, except this one studio, really two studios out of 100, told me to come in and, and do some work for them. That's all right. That's yeah. all right. The fact that you called everybody, got laughed at, got hung up on. Man, you know, I, man I, I, was, I was flipping albums over to tell you how far I'm going back. I'm flipping albums over and reading the, the notes like such and such studio. I'm like, all right, let me try that. Let me such and such wow. studio. All right, let me give them a call. Yeah, you're right. Because we're talking about 86. There was no Google. You couldn't no just Google. type in recording studios in the Manhattan area and the yeah. GPS blast go out. Well, to just that it, <laughs> Wow. Well, so know, it, exactly. I'm flipping CDs over, cassette tapes over. <laughs> <laughs> reading where they got published and said you know what i'm gonna call that number it's on here that's oh, in my man, area man you know i'll tell you a crazy story one time i was uh i had a houdini album i still got it in fact I flipped it over and i remember seeing zomba recording studios mm -hmm. in london england i said man i'm gonna call uh, and and the producer at the time was larry smith i said man i'm gonna call zomba in, in london and sure enough, I called the studio, said, can I speak to Larry Smith? And Larry Smith actually got on the phone, and he actually had Houdini in the studio with him that day. They were actually producing the album together. So I got a chance to speak to Houdini, and, and while they were, you know, kicking the album in London, and with a super producer at the time, Larry Smith. D, D, D. Yo, big shouts out to one of my DJ partners in the building. What's good with you, Sean Collier? John, good building. evening, sir. Good evening. Yeah, that that's you know, it's one of those things when um I was real competitive as a DJ when I got into this, and it's just like if you was in that space, I felt like yo, that's money I'm supposed to be making. That's my spot you standing in. After me, after meeting this brother, though, he was the one that told me flat out, I was like, yo, we in this together. I right. eat, you eat. And I was oh. like, well, that's different. Climbing was inclined right there. Right. That that yeah. threw me off. I'm like, wait a minute. We uh, we good. That's all right right there. That's all right. Yeah, yeah and he's all, also a award winning DJ. Yo, he's somebody that you definitely got to check out, man. My Yo, he does a little bit of everything outside of the, just music. My man run party buses. So, you know, if y'all trying to yeah, y'all trying to hit this hit the city wow. and celebrate for something, yo, hit my man's up. He's right there. Um yeah, and, and for all my Facebook viewers, just click on it. Very cool. Very cool. Yeah, definitely. I, I, Mr. Sean, follow me on IG. Indeed. Definitely. more. Indeed, indeed. Well, yeah, Dana, absolutely. I just saw Dana method. Definitely. Let's make it happen. Yeah. Hey, Dana, don't be plugging on my show, man. <laughs> that, that, that's going to run you 50 bucks, G. <laughs> but, nah, hey, look, just like just like my man told me, man. Look, I'm eating weed, man. See, and he did it again. See, that's why I'm saying, like, it's hard to try to be all extra arrogant and competitive when the dude's all humble with you. Oh, man, you know, that's, that's, <laughs> having, the right, that's having the right people around you, man. That's what's up. <laughs> but, yo, but, hey, but like I said, that's one of the homies right there. I'll never forget um, ATL's hottest one year um, was about 2018. And yeah, um, Brian, Brian Marshall, shout out to Brian Marshall. Yeah, definitely, big shout out to Brian K. Marshall. So we're both up for uh, ATL's hottest DJ. I never forget it was a Tuesday night, and it was my son's birthday. Uh -huh. We all we all stand up on stage, and I'm thinking they mispronounced my name or something because I didn't hear DJ Agony. I'm like, yo, is this? <laughs> I'm over there looking at the mic like, excuse me, excuse me, this this thing on, this thing working? <laughs> oh man, it's, it's broken. Yo, somebody come fix this stuff. But no, he he won that night, right? Okay. And um, I saw him that Sunday. And he had his trophy and everything. And I was like, yo, let's get pictures. You know what I'm saying? He put the trophy on the side and told me, it ain't about the trophy. We just taking pictures as two DJs. Right, there you go. There you I was go. like, yo, you really make this hard, G. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but but you know, I mean, it's, it's a lot of fun. And, and it's cool when you get to, um, in, in traveling through this thing we call entertainment, meet people like that, you know. So yeah. definitely yeah. big shots out. You know what I'm saying? Sean Carr, big shouts out to Dana J. Yeah. Um, but yo, so okay, so you figured out 
Prince can sing, you couldn't, but you could push the buttons really well. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. What was the uh what was the first song you worked on? Oh man, the first song that well, as assistant manager, I didn't actually do any production. I was just basically standing in the wings watching everything, but I would probably have to say, um Brenda K. Starr came into the studio and she did a project and she's um well, she's real big on Latino music now. But Brenda K. Starr had a song back in the days called I Still Believe. And Mariah Carey actually started out as a background singer. In fact, it's because of Brenda K. Starr taking her demo tape, Mariah Carey demo tape, to Tommy Mottola at Columbia Records. That's how Mariah got put on. Mm. But uh, Brenda K. Starr, I want to say, is the first record that uh, pretty much the first project that I was able to hang out and you know, be in the studio, real cool person. And then from then on, uh, Roy Ayers came in, uh, Harry Belafonte's son, David Belafonte came in, Fonda Ray, who's real big up north, she came in and did a session. So that was what's up, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's big though. Like like I said, they have seen those names in and out. It's just like, word. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. So that's yeah. That's yeah, definitely for about a year. So did the studios for about a year. Let me ask you this though. So being being a sound engineer, what was that uh what was that project that you worked on? It was just like, you know what? I'm actually having fun with this one. You know what? I'll tell you something I actually did work on uh on the production side, not so much as an engine. Well, I was not even really on the engineer side, but me and MC Search did a record together. MC yeah, Search, MC third Search, base. Yeah. yeah, MC Search, yeah. Shout out to MC Search from third base. But me Definitely. and Soap worked on a record one time together. A uh, gentleman by the name of Chappelle Chase had a group, and we produced Chappelle Chase and his group. I can't even remember what the group name was, but, but we did it at Power Play Studio with DJ Ivan Rodriguez. And that was probably my only record that I actually helped produce and stuff, even though Search took control of the majority of it. But then I moved away from that area and uh, about a year later started working at Billboard Magazine. So I worked for the magazine? Yeah, I started working for Billboard. Okay, what'd you do at Billboard? Billboard, actually my job was to call radio stations and record stores and get their top 20 hits. So I would call... You know, all the radio stations around the, the, the country. And the way Billboard was set up back in the days, they would mail out the sheet to all the radio stations and the record stores that were reporting to Billboard. And the sheet would have these three digit numbers on it. It would say Michael Jackson Bad 448, Mariah Carey 227, Janet Jackson 11 117, something like that. And uh, so did the record stores as well. And I would actually call the record stores the radio stations for black albums and black single charts and basically say, okay, hey, I'm, I'm calling from Billboard. And they would just run off the numbers. They wouldn't say who the artist was or the song. They would just say 112-449-887-669. And I would key that in. And that's how you got the black album and the black single charts every week in Billboard. The problem with that was, and we're talking late 80s, 86, 87, there was a lot of uh, under the table payoff Pay for, record labels, for record stores and radio stations to report a certain artist number one, number two, and number three. And that's that's one of the reasons why the whole sound scan came about because you know if you call a, a record store and let's say Cleveland, Ohio, and she's been reporting, you know, Michael Jackson number one for the next for the last five weeks only to realize that the record label redesigned her kitchen. <laughs> you know, so a lot of that, a lot of that was going on. Yeah. Yeah. Pay, I mean, payola is real though. And, and yeah, it definitely was real. <laughs> it's definitely real, but yo, that's crazy. So you, you're sitting here telling me that in the late eighties, you were building the billboard charts. Oh yeah. Yeah. And then I went on to, uh, the hip hop charts when he finally put hip hop on billboard. I started calling record stores and radio stations. To get their hip hop list, that's yeah. crazy. So, yeah, so people, nice. all the billboards lists that y'all been looking at and seeing who number one, this is yeah. the band that put them together. Oh yeah, yeah, from back in the days. And I'll tell you something that's real crazy that 
when I was at Billboard, um, and I always tell people my co-workers at the time were Craig Coleman. Mm -hmm. We had a when I knew Craig Coleman, he was probably about maybe 18, 19. Uh, he had a label at the time called Big Beat Records, but he's now the CEO of Atlantic Records. Um, who else? Nelson George was also one of my co-workers. And Nelson George... The the, the, histo the hip-hop hip historian, right? Yeah, exactly. Yep, Nelson George, hip-hop historian, did CB4 with Chris Rock. And then Bill Coleman, who uh, is now one of the, the biggest DJs in New York, also managed uh, Jody Watley. We all worked together. Uh, Bill Coleman was in charge of, he was like a dance music editor. And then Craig Coleman did the one, I think he did the pop charts or the dance chart. And I'm Indeed. not too sure what Nelson did, but he was also on the same floor. Yo, so let me ask you this. Did you get to meet Jody Watley? I didn't meet Jody Watley. You know what? I haven't, let me see. Did I, I actually didn't meet Jody, but I did talk to her one time going way back. I talked to her on MySpace. Ah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I did meet, uh, when I worked at Billboard, I'll tell you who actually came through. Uh, Bee Gees came through. Tell me, staying alive? Huh? Yeah, Bee Gees staying alive. Oh, wow. Uh, they came through. Angela Winbush came through. Ah. Stacey Lattisor came through. Okay. And um, Bee Gees, Stacey Lattisor, Layla, uh, uh, um, Muhammad Ali's daughter. Layla uh, Ali? Maya Ali, who used to be a rapper. Oh, okay. Yeah, there's a bunch of people that came through. Uh, like I say, Angela, went, yeah, a couple of people. Stacey Lattice, so a couple other people came through. Right, right, right. So you're at Billboard. You're putting together the labels or putting together the charts. What mm -hmm. happens next? Uh, I actually, uh, was, me and MC Search was hanging out tough every weekend. And uh, one day Search says to me, Hey, what are you doing uh, later today? You want to go to a meeting with me? And I say, yeah, no problem. I'll go to a meeting with you. So we go to this meeting. And in the meeting, uh, I'll never forget, it was in Latin quarters. And in the meeting was uh, KRS-One, Bismarcky, Melly Mel, Professor X from X-Clan, and um, Milk from Audio 2. Wow. And uh, as we're all having a conversation in the meeting, the meeting was really supposed to be a meeting that was supposed to help artists that needed medical, like we were trying to build like a medical, uh, let's say a Blue Cross Blue Shield for, for hip-hop artists. Which, it, is which is very needed. Definitely. So if a hip-hop artist was going through some medical issues, we were trying to put all this together. Of course, you know, it never really came to fruition. But when I was you know, introducing myself at, from Billboard magazine, I said, basically, you know, my name is Terry Moore, I work at Billboard, and I was done. And MC Search was like, nah, 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 let me tell you this brother, this brother's running Billboard. So he really gave me a lot of love at that meeting, not knowing that Milk was sitting next to me, and Milk went back to his father, Nat Robinson, who owned First Priority Music. Right. He said, hey, Dad, I met this guy at uh, this meeting, his name is Terry Moore. And uh, so Nat Robinson went to this other guy to say, hey, you got a cousin that work at Billboard named Terry Moore? And the other guy said, yeah, yeah, that's my cousin. Well, the other guy that said that's my cousin turned out to be DJ K-Rock and she likes DJ. DJ K-Rock is also Kenneth Moore. And uh, Light is actually Lana Moore. So I joined First Priority Music, uh, left Billboard to actually go to First Priority Music and uh, became the publicist for MC Light, Audio 2, Positive K, Mishi Me from Canada, uh, Kings of Swings, who actually have DJ Coco Chanel out of New York. Coco Chanel actually started out with uh, Kings of Swings, and she was on Virgin Records with Kings of Swings. They had a song called Nod Your Head to This. Right. And um, who else was on the label that I can think of? MC Peaches and a couple of other artists, but I was uh, first priority, first publicist. Yeah, that's crazy. You realize how much history was just in that statement. Like this, it like people, I don't know if y'all paid attention or not, but the story started off. Yeah, I was just hanging out with MC Search one day. <laughs> that's where the great hair comes from. Right, you know, just randomly hanging out with MC Search. Just yeah. no biggie, you know, I mean, just kind of kicking it around, you know. Uh -huh. <laughs> and then, you know, I just happened to go to this meeting with KRS 
Marley Marl and and and, Art, and Biz, Biz and Audio Two. You know, they they were just hanging out too, and you know. Then after that, you know, DJ K Rock, let me get a scratch. And, <laughs> yeah, and, right. and I find out him and MC like my cousin them. Right. <laughs> right. You know, that's it's, it's a lot that goes uh, into a story yeah, like man, that. Thank you. Thank you. You know, thank where you. it's like, well, you know, I got to I gotta create me one like that. Like, yeah, you know, one day I was just hanging out, you know, me and T.I. eating a couple of fish sandwiches. <laughs> and- <laughs> <laughs> hey, 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 and I'll tell you, I'll, I'll tell you a... Uh, a, a crazy MC search story, if, if I got two seconds. Oh, you man, you got another 40 minutes. Go oh, for it. Definitely. So search calls me up one day. He's like, yo, I need you to ride with me. And uh, I said, all right, cool. Where are we going? He said, we're going to the hospital. Mm. And uh, we, we we lived in Queens and Far Rock over Great Queens. I lived on 9th, 7th Street. I lived on 17th Street. Search lived on 9th Street. So that's how close we were as far as the neighborhood. But we drove up to the Bronx. And I remember when we was walking to, through the hospital doors, you know how you got the revolving doors that's spinning around? Right. So we're walking in the doors, and I remember looking to my right like it was yesterday, and this dude was laying on the floor like bawling. Like bawling, like, and I knew who the dude was, but we kept walking, and we went to the elevator, took the elevator up to the ICU unit, and we went to this uh, this area where it was me search this other guy that was on the other side of the bed. And it was this guy that was laying in the bed. He had tubes coming all out of his mouth and, you know, hooked up to the machine. Now, let me reverse. Going through the doors, when I looked to my right and saw the brother crying, that was actually uh, one of the Jungle Brothers. When I went upstairs to the ICU room, me and Search was on one side of the bed, and there was another guy on the other side of the bed. The other guy was actually Trevor from the Ultra Magnetic. And the guy that was actually laying in bed was Scott LaRock. Whoa. When he had got, when he had got shot. Whoa. Yeah. So wait a minute, you got Jungle Brothers, UMCs, yeah. and, and, and Scott LaRock's in the hospital bed. Yeah, that was that was like literally maybe an hour, maybe a day or two before he passed. Yeah, Scott LaRock, and he was all stuff. And yeah, I remember that man. He was laying on his back with the tubes coming all out, and like it was yesterday. Wow, that yeah. that's a lot. Yeah, that's a lot. I mean, but damn, like this is like I said, it's so much history in that though. And, and, and mind you, you know, I don't know if y'all noticed this or not, people, but we didn't even got to the '90s yet. Yeah, yeah, this is still because yeah. Scott Scott LaRock passing with 88, 87? Yeah, about 88, yeah. It was like 88, right. Yeah. Mm, that's that's a lot. Um, but yeah, once again, people, the story started off. MC Search called me up to say take a ride with me. <laughs> like, you know, I mean, I get phone calls like that all the time. <laughs> appreciate it. Appreciate it. Yeah, search, search, love to search. Search always always had my back. Indeed, y'all still in contact? Nah, you know, I shouldn't say that. Once in a blue moon, we, we connect on Facebook. You know, he's living in Florida now. And, you know, we're all getting older. But every once in a while, I'll put something up on Facebook of a, you know, of a of a memory. And he'll chime in and say, yo, I remember when we was, you know, hanging out and that happened. Like that. Indeed. So, yeah, shout out to Search. Definitely. That's, that's a big shout out. Um, All right. So... Take me up to take me up to where we are now, because you know you and the MC Light and DJ K Rock and Positive K and Audio Two are now a unit, and you're you're the publisher for them. Right. Yeah. So so basically, uh, after and 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 I'll tell you something real quick to tell you how I believe my personal belief is everything happens in divine order. Everything is is, is in step. Yeah, so right. when I was when I was calling recording studios i was actually calling record labels too okay trying to get put on with record labels and one of the labels i used to call was first priority music i didn't even know anything about first priority music they wasn't really big at the time all i knew is that they were the label out of brooklyn and um i don't even know if i even had a, a first priority record but i remember i kept calling the label hi can i speak to nat robinson and a young lady would say 
Matt Robinson thought he had connected a message. This went on for about a year. Ooh. A year. Matt Robinson would never call me back because I realized, well, I found out later from the receptionist who I actually started dating because I called the, the label so much. Me and the receptionist started dating. I was like, well, listen, I can't get in touch with Nat. What are you doing? Man? You know? Right. And uh, <laughs> like, yeah, my well. But I found out that it was actually an answering service that was like sort of a like uh like a uh it wasn't actually the real label it was an answering service taking oh. messages for priority music so it was like so a I third was, party you would call in yeah yeah so you know just a young lady like you know like you got the different numbers all going to the same office <laughs> one minute she's answering for acme corporation the next minute first priority music and think of, and that was never returning calls so it was ironic that I happen to be sitting in milk next to milk in that meeting, he goes back to his father. His father circles back and comes and says, "Hey, we want to hire you." And I start working for first priority like that. So you know, out the bat, they literally hired me because of my connections with the radio station calling Bill from Billboard. They said mm. this guy got all the connection with all these different radio stations. We're gonna hire him to do radio promotion. Mm, okay. I did that for about two weeks. <laughs> when they said you are now, you're now a publicist. And ah. I had no idea what a publicist does. I was like, okay, I, you know, and that said, I said, Nat, I don't know anything about being a publicist. He said, you need to learn or learn something like that. And uh, so I'm guessing they didn't have OJT at uh, first priority. Oh, nothing, record. man. I couldn't Google nothing. I like, I, didn't, <laughs> right, so I literally just jumped in and um, started calling magazines, radio station, newspapers. Just trying to get light, milk, all of them, you know, just trying to set them up with interviews. And uh, being a publicist was great because that also opened up the door for me to get to know Will Smith when he was Daddy Jeff and Fresh Prince, Latifah when she was with Tommy Boy, when she was just Latifah, not even Queen at the time. Mm. Um, who else um, got a chance to hang out with Tupac one night? So that was real cool. No, no, no. Well, yeah, rewind yeah, that, yeah, rewind that, was, that, was, that back. You, you, you can't just breeze past. I hung out with Tupac one night. Yeah, yeah. yeah don't I, worry. I, Even if we didn't have time, we got time for that story. I. <laughs> well, what happened was uh, hey, like exactly, Conan. Like he, hey, Conan, tell him again. He can't breeze past that one. That's, I appreciate, I appreciate that. <laughs> that's a I no go. That. Yeah, I, and you know, light, light was doing a taping of Showtime at the Apollo. Okay. And um, it was Light, Digital Underground, and a couple of other groups that were all taping different segments at the same time. And um, Tupac at the time was hanging out with Digital Underground because he was still with them. But right. the thing about it, that night, they had it all, like the way... Uh, the Apollo Theater is set up is that their green room, you know, when you go to a studio, TV studio, their green room would be like the size of my office with a couple of sofas and a table and, a, you know, a big table with snacks. Well, the Apollo Theater, their green room is actually like the basement under the stadium. And so it was literally filled with all these people, including all the groups that were performing on the show, including Digital Underground. And I remember that night was the night that Juice was supposed to be released. Wow. And um, I remember we was like, yo, because we had did the sound check and the Apollo Theater, Showtime at the Apollo show said, hey, you know, we got about four or five hours before we actually start taping. And we was like, okay, what are we going to do for four or five hours? And then K-Rock said, well, let's go downtown to Times Square and go see Juice. And we even said to Tupac, like, yo, we're going to go see Juice. You coming? He's like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm coming. I'll be there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you <laughs> know, know, I ain't seen that movie since I was in it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. So with me, K-Rock, Light had another DJ at the time, Master T, and a bodyguard born. And I remember when we left the movie theater, we were just really, we were blown away. And I remember going back to the Apollo Theater, and we were all in the green room, and I was 
I was sitting in a chair and Tupac was standing up against this column because in the, the green room in the basement, they had all these columns and he was just standing, leaning up against it. And I remember telling him like, yo, man, yo, you, you, you did that in juice. I mean, but he, it was like, he was so carefree. He was just laughing. He was joking. It was almost like, like, um, I can't believe I'm here. Like, like he's like, I'm at the Apollo Theater. And he was just so happy. He was laughing. But I believe he knew because the buzz was really starting to, to come up with about you. He knew, like, okay, it's about to be on. But he was at that point just like the happiest go lucky guy, like, man, I'm just glad to be here. And, and it's, it's one of those things like the Apollo Theater, we talking about for an entertainer, that's hollow ground. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You know, oh, that's. Yeah. That's that's yeah. like that's like a pilgrimage to Mecca. That's like you know yeah. what I'm saying. It's it's like Jerusalem. That is that is hollow ground for an entertainment. Yeah. Exactly. And, exactly. And the fact that you know, I mean, seeing yourself on a big screen, and oh, people right. are rocking with this movie. I mean, we, you bring up Juice. I told I was literally talking to somebody earlier today that Juice is the movie that made me want to DJ. I was mm. the wow. first the first time I watched Juice. Uh, I was twelve. Okay. And I said, you know what? I want to do that, man. That's what's up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and so, like from from there, like I, that was one of those things I couldn't shake. Job yeah. after job, career in and out or whatever. But I, I've never, I've never stopped DJing. But it all started the first time I saw Juice. Yeah, yeah. That 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 that's an epic movie. Epic movie. The movie. I mean, it still is. I mean, the anniversary edition came out uh, maybe about a year, a couple of years ago. Okay. I, I had to hurry up and buy it. It's on Blu-ray. Um, only reason why I didn't buy a copy to not open was because I'm like, yo, this juice, I'm going to watch this as much as humanly possible. <laughs> <laughs> right, exactly. Exactly. Yeah, man. But yeah, so man, so you got to, you actually hung out with Bishop. That wasn't Tupac. That was Bishop you hung out with. Yeah. Because yeah. he cool. Bishop yeah, cool. I'm very cool. Yeah, you're, you're <laughs> <doing the same. laughs> right. All right, but yeah, very cool, very down to earth, man. Definitely very down to earth. Yeah, man. So wow, that's and and, and you hung up with Tupac. Like, it's not even a lot of people, uh, not even people alive that can say that they actually got FaceTime with Tupac. Still, yeah. you know. Yeah. But yeah. I mean, this is like you know, and and I was telling somebody earlier when you hear stories like this, this is what's called living history, people. This is living history. This this man is 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 born to me that he's in hip hop encyclopedia because a lot of the stuff that was happening, he was there. He was just like, yeah, yeah. yeah. you know, and, yeah. and and it's crazy because it started off about you seeing Prince want to be in music and entertainment. Yeah. Yet you didn't have to jump in front of the camera. Thankfully, you didn't touch the mic because I heard you couldn't say. Right. <laughs> yeah. But you got to witness so much history. Like that's yeah. that's big. So we're yeah. at about, if if our math's correct, we're at about ninety two now. Yeah, and this is around a time, from what I remember with music, this is around a time where it's a shift change coming. It's yeah. moving, it's moving away from New York, going to the West Coast. Yeah. Now, would you, with what you were doing being New York based, how did you deal with that shift? Well, you know, around ninety two, I actually I, I was with first priority from about eighty seven, eighty eight to ninety two, and I actually started working with Red Alert. And um, Red, at the time that I started working with Red Alert, I was also working with a company called Major Damage Clothing. Shout out to Gene P, one of my good friends. Um, when I left first priority music. Gene Peterson was actually one of the bodyguards at, at the label. And I remember one time I called Gene, I said, yo, I'm out. And he's like, yo, I'm out too. And I'm like, wait a minute, why are you out? And he said, yo, because you brought me in. And so me and him started a partnership together where basically we went to this, this clothing company called Major Damage Clothing. Major Damage Clothing used to be run by these two white guys that started Sergio Valente Gene. Mm. And he started Sergio Valente Jean after it made billions, sold Sergio, and they wanted to start a hip hop line called Major Damage. So they brought me and Gene in to basically put clothes on everybody. So uh, if you look at Naughty by Nature's second album, 
you'll see Tretch is wearing uh, a major damage coat. And that's what we did. We actually got the, the clothes so, on a lot of people. So we're um, talking about the uh, the 1993 album, correct? Yeah, we sold it up the chain store. Yeah, the Hip Hop Array album, right? Yep, yep. He's got a blue French coat on, sort of denim jacket, and he's got the Major Damage logo on it. And uh, so we put clothes on uh, D Nice when D Nice was like maybe seven, 16, 17 at the time. Because I knew D Nice from when he was with Boogie Down Productions. Ah. Yeah, so that's, that's how far back I know Derek. And um, he called him Derek, y'all. Yeah, that he go, man. He, I, I, you know what? Let me tell. I'll tell you this real crazy story. Going back, so this this um, I was writing for Write On magazine. Right on. I remember Right On because it was like Right On. Right, right on sat next. It, it sat next to Word Up. Yeah, it, I, I used to write for Word Up too. Okay, so I wrote for Write On. <laughs> I wrote for Write On magazine at the time that I was writing that. Hold on one second. Let me. Let me drop something real quick. I happen to be having it right here because I'm trying to figure out what I'm going to do with it. But this is the cover of the Write On magazine that I wrote. I don't know if y'all can see that. Wow. So this is the cover of the Write On magazine that I wrote. Shout out to Cynthia Horner, who didn't know me from a can of paint, but I called her up and said, hey, I want to write for Write On, and she gave me a whole issue to write. So... Yeah, I like she didn't know my background, no nothing. She was like, she All right, what are you so doing? she didn't like, know if she didn't know if you could form a sentence. Didn't know if I could form a sentence, and she's like, All right, I got a bit of background. I said, I work for Billboard magazine, da, da da. She said, All right. And at that time I was making my transition from Billboard to first priority music. So I was sort of in between. But one night I was interviewing K R not K R S one, um Big Daddy came for the audit for the for the uh, for the issue. And you know what? I hate when I mix those two up. I be mixing up my interviews. I'm like, man, yeah, yeah. I was talking to Chris. No, yeah, hey, it was hey, Kane. Hey, when, when you're 56, man, it's like, wait a minute, who uh, like that? So what happened was I was at I Billboard Magazine. This is a true story. And KRS, um, I keep saying KRS one. Big Daddy Kane came to Billboard. I said, okay, I got to interview Kane for this magazine. I didn't have no place to interview him. So I said, well, I'm still at Billboard. I said, Kane, listen, I'm at Billboard magazine. Why don't you come up after everybody is gone? You know, place normally close up around 6, 7 o'clock. Why don't you come about 7, 30, 8? And I'm going to interview. This is the first time I'm actually meeting Kane. So Kane comes up to Billboard. I sit down with no problem. I interview him. He came up with one of his boys. Did the interview, but the next day when I came back to Billboard, they was man like, who did you have up in his office? They didn't know, cause they didn't know who came with. All they saw was black, and you got this guy coming up, and I'm like, that Big Daddy Kane, like they, uh, we don't know who that is. But anyway, you can't be bringing people up. So my next interview was KRS One, and I said, well, I can't, I can't bring him to Billboard. Where I'm gonna bring him? So. I literally took uh, in Times Square, Billboard magazine at the time was located right in Times Square, but right across the street there was a McDonald's. So me, KRS One, D Nice, and Miss Melody, we walked across the streets in the McDonald's and we sat down and did the interview. And there's actually a picture. In fact, I'm looking at uh -oh. it right now. Uh oh, uh, watch this, y'all. Watch this. I already there's know something gonna happen, y'all. I'm going to show you D Nice real quick. Cause I'm looking at it. So after the interview, we actually uh, okay. Let me go this way here. That's Where'd Derek KRS One and Miss Melody, and you can see Derek jumping up. Right. Yeah, right there, and that was wow. right in Times Square, right after we did the interview. So That's crazy. Um, after after writing for Write On Magazine and doing the whole issue, uh, that's when I made the final transition to working with First Priority. And then after First Priority in 92, me and Gene started traveling all over the country, putting clothes on different people. And that's how I got back to D-Nice. So which which is crazy was, because, so now you went from a publicist to a stylist. <laughs> yeah, for real. With no experience, you know? <laughs> Wait a minute. And in the midst of you being a publicist and a stylist, you were a journalist. Yeah, yeah, but still no experience. 
<laughs> you know what? Let me tell you, man. It, <laughs> I love it, though. I, I, I've been very, very blessed to say to myself, you know what? It would be nice to write for a magazine and just call people and see if I can make it happen. Or it'd be nice to work for a record label. And 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 and, and it happens. So I, you know, somebody told me the other day, you know, Terry, you always speak things into existence, and I I, I believe that. Favor, yes, absolutely, favor. No doubt, Sean. No doubt, favor. So, you know, uh, me and Gene Indeed. was putting clothes on different celebrities, but then also, we besides doing major damage, we also did some work with Flex. I did some work with Kenny Smith that year. Kenny Smith from the Houston Rockets. Kenny actually had a record label called Baseline to Baseline. Kenny the Jet Smith, yo. Kenny, Kenny the Jet Smith had a record label called Baseline to Baseline, and I worked that label as a publicist for maybe about a year and then uh in between working with red alert anyway red alert i'm trying to think of anybody else and that's pretty much it for 92 to 94 before i came to Atlanta. he said that's pretty much it <laughs> <laughs> hey, hey you know what the verbiage and the humility is what's killing me right now because it's like oh, wait man, a minute. I that. It's it, a it, because it's, it, it's killing me because it's like yeah you know it was krs1 Red alert, you know, put clothes <laughs> on people, you know. A blessing, man. Hey, and, 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 and I have to say this because I know I, you probably don't know and your viewers don't know, but I actually have cerebral palsy. I actually have a disability. Really? Oh, yeah, yeah. So, like, when I'm sitting down, you can't see it, but if I get up and walk, you can tell. I, me and a guy by the name of uh, John Funk, uh, Dave Funk and Klein, Back in the 80s was the only two people in the music industry that was actually physically disabled. That's deep. Yeah. When I was born, my mom had the German measles. And because my birth was so complicated, the doctors actually told my mom and my dad to put me in a nursing home. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Good thing they didn't listen. Right. Oh, yeah, Good thing they didn't listen. <laughs> Good thing they didn't listen, for real. Because, yeah, exactly. I mean, absolutely. We, we, we got. We got like literally living history going on right now. Appreciate it. Thank you. Because of that. So after you've done everything between 92 and 94. Wow. <laughs> so we go into 95. And and this this period right here, I call 95 through 97. I call that the pocket. In my personal opinion, the best hip hop ever came between 95 and 97. Yeah. Even though, you know, and those were the years at the same time we lost Biggie, we lost Pop, we lost Easy. But you look at the music that came out in that period. Yeah. That yeah. is that is that that is that that hotbed. Yeah. Yeah. Um, where are you at in this point? Because I know you're somewhere. You're well, no, you then know, you're not you're honest, not somewhere, yeah. you're actually everywhere, probably. Yeah, you know what? To be uh, completely honest with you, I was between 94 and 97 was nowhere music wise. And I'll tell you what happened. Oh, when I was in when I was in New York and I decided to move to Atlanta, I literally came to Atlanta. I tell people all the time with a chip on my shoulder. I was like, I'm gonna go down to Georgia. I've I've worked with Puffy, I work with Light, I work with Queen. Man, when I get down to Georgia, I'm gonna be they're gonna fall all over me. They're gonna be like, oh man, we can't wait to work this guy. Oh man, we can't wait to do stuff with this guy. I came down there like a little Georgia town, with a little Southern town. You know what they said? Do you know Jim, Jermaine Dupree? Do you know Dallas Austin? We don't care nothing about what you did in New York. Do you know TLC? And I was like, nope. So the worst mistake I made before coming to Atlanta was not really networking enough when I came down here thinking my accolades in New York was going to carry me over. But when I got down here, you know, now don't get me wrong, I, I had a chance to meet some incredible artists down here, but it didn't really connect because, like I say, I was in, back in the days in the early 90s, mid 90s, Atlanta was very cliquish. You know, mm -hmm. Dallas Austin had his crew, Jermaine Dupree had his crew, Usher had his crew. So mm -hmm. anybody, and they wasn't really feeling New York. They was like, we weren't we down here. <laughs> We weren't. I I just got to be honest with you. We we wasn't at all. 
<laughs> right. So you know, cause you from you from Georgia. Right, right. I'm born and raised right here. Yeah, so right. I, and and the consensus down here was if you weren't banging organized noise, uh outcast, goody mob, or like you said, Jermaine Dupree, anything from right. Dallas Austin, TLC Usher. If you wasn't banging none of that, it's like, you know, we ain't trying to hear that. Exactly. Like, like, yo. They were like, we don't care. It's but like, yo, I got Latifah. You know, somebody run up, yo, I got the new Mob Deep. So what? I got the new Outcast. Right. <laughs> Call me when you got exactly. something important to talk about. Like, exactly. Nah, I'm trying to hear that. And, and, and to tell you how, the, and, and this is total transparency, to tell you how out of tune I was, I never forget, I was standing outside the beautiful restaurant one night. This is literally the first year I got here. Mm-hmm. And I was standing outside on Cascade Road in a beautiful and I was on the corner, and this dude was signing autographs. These kids were running up to him. That's because, see, I didn't do my homework. I didn't, I didn't study before I came out here. So when I saw the dude signing autographs, I was like, Dallas, Dallas. And he ignored me. And I was like, Dallas. Because I'm giving to say, yo, man, I work with so-and-so down here from New York. Dallas. That dude signed them kids' autographs and walked away because it wasn't balanced. It was big gift. <laughs> so that was so funny. He was like, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this guy? Like, you know what I'm saying? He was like, I know you ain't talking to me. Like, but I had me. to learn over and over. And I did make some good connections. I wind up connecting with um these dudes that had and, and and you probably know who i'm talking about they had a rim shop everybody went to the rim shop in downtown atlanta phil phil and somebody else phil and his brother they were from yeah. detroit okay. and they had a rim shop right on peace street street mm-hmm. and everybody went to the rim shop and I, I got a chance to meet uh a bunch of people like uh the girl that used to sing or uh, she passed away the song director damon dane from exclusivity, they used to be on the face. Ah, okay. Yeah, exclusivity. So there was a couple people here and there that I would meet like that. But from 97, from 94 to 97, didn't really do much with music. And then 97, I actually got back in corporate and started working for Coca-Cola. So I did Coca-Cola for about eight years before I jumped back into music. Really? Yep. Yeah, so, I was like that, so you, you know what? So you make your I, way all the way through music and then go to selling soda. Man. Oh, let me tell you. That is crazy. It's like, gotta you know. This crazy story. I'm so, here for it. All right, listen to this. So this is probably the most transparent interview. But I remember one of my first jobs after leaving the whole music scene was 1-800-Flowers. And okay. so I'm like answering. Nobody at the job, nobody at 1-800-Flowers, even though I won't even tell anybody at 1-800-Flowers, what I used to do when I before I came to 1-800-Flowers. I'm like trying right. to be so low-key. I'm like, how the hell did I go from? Because people are going to be like, damn, bro, you fell off. What? Well, you, listen, you was two years ago. You was on the road with, with Light and Latifah, and now you take a flower order. How's that? It's like, man, like, it's like, brother, you ain't even do drugs. <laughs> I completely, so I never forget, man, I was, I was taking calls one day. And I said, hey, this is Terry, 1-800-Flowers. How can I help you? The girl said, Terry Moore? Terry no. Moore? It's somebody I knew from back in the days that worked at one of the radio stations. And I remember, man, I fell all the way down. to. The, I was like, she said, oh, my God, wait till I tell everybody I spoke to you. I was like, no. No, 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 this ain't me. <laughs> man, I'm telling you. And, and you, you're a better man than me because they would be like, Ray, is that you? Hell no. Nah. Not a hung up. <laughs> you get no flowers? I should have, man. I should have disconnected. Like, you are not getting it. Because my name now is Customer Rep 8709 Dash. And you will not be getting flowers from me. You will <laughs> not. Out. But yeah, man, that was, it humbled me, but it taught me a lot because what I learned of, about it was you know, it really helped me pick myself back up because. Then I wind up, like I say, I work for Coca. I work for Coca Cola mainly to get into marketing for Coca Cola. Mm. I was like, let me go and let me get into Coca Cola so I can do marketing for them and do commercials for them and stuff. 
That was the plan. But with Coca-Cola, of course, you got the glass ceiling. You got the, and I did that for about eight years before I wind up coming out and getting back into music. Yep. Let me get around these crazy folks I know in real life. Because, <laughs> I mean, you could be at Coke for 30 years and never meet the people upstairs. You Never. Exactly. Right. Exactly. Absolutely. But, yeah. You know, with music, you bond a lot of running to somebody, even if you had a soul food joint and you think you're talking to Dallas Austin and his big guilt. Exactly. exactly. Which, which is so funny to me because they look absolutely nothing alike. <laughs> I know. But you know, I'm coming from New York, man. I didn't, I didn't study. The number one rule is if you're going to make that move, I should have, of course, you know, the internet, it makes everything easy, but this was before Facebook, MySpace kicked off, so right. I should have really built the connection. I had two years, because in 92, I had decided to move to Atlanta, so I had two years before I came down here. Okay, and, but, and with everything you had going on in New York, why move here? A couple reasons. One is, well, three reasons. One is at the time I was dating a young lady who wound up being my wife, now my ex-wife, she had a six-year-old son. And I was like, you know, he needs a better environment to grow up. New York is not really going to be the right environment for him. And then the second thing, music was blasting here, music was picking up. And then also at some point, I really got tired of just being in New York. I was like, I want something different. And I started to think about New Jersey. And I was like, man, if I go to New Jersey, I might as well stay in New York. I mean, it's yeah. like right across, you know. It's I, like New, it's like New York Junior. Exactly, exactly. And then I thought about Houston because I was working with Kenny Smith at the time. But I'm like, you know what? Kenny trying to win championships. He ain't trying to hang out. He's Kenny doing his own thing. I get down to Houston, don't know nobody, and Kenny doing his own thing. And so I wind up saying, yo, I might as well go to Atlanta because the music is kicking off, and I know at least I know a few people in Atlanta. And and I, you didn't know the difference between Dallas Austin and Big Gip, though. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that's crazy, <laughs> man. That's crazy. But you know what? It's, it's one of those things. It's like um, you came down here and you made it, though, because there was, uh, I remember, a large influx of people moving down here from the north. That they thinking it's country. We slow. We walk around barefoot. It's tumbleweed rolling down streets. Like, no, like. We had our own thing down here. Oh, yeah. We yeah. had our own thing. I mean, yeah. and, and I met a lot of people, and particularly at, you know what I'm saying, people like about me at 40s now, came yeah. down here to either go to an HBCU, came down here to visit, to go to Freaknik because one of their cousins was here, and yeah. just never went back. Right. right. But then after after having been here, you realize, you know what? Nah, it ain't. It's it's not a... Uh, it's not the back though, the backwoods as as they exactly. thought it was. It's definitely not, man. I've been here since '94, so I know. You know, uh, one of the brothers that convinced me to come down. Uh, shout out in memory to Todd Montiero. Todd mm. was the brother that, if you ever saw the movie The Super, yeah, he's the one, he's the one that's holding Joe Pesci up in the movie poster. He's yo, I, yeah, he was. Uh, yo, I, I used to love that movie. Yeah, Joe Pesci was, was the slumlord. Man. Yeah, yeah, exactly. He was a milkman at the basketball court when they were playing. Todd was one of the brothers that said, yo, come down to Atlanta. And I remember one of the things that convinced me to come down to Atlanta was I came down, Todd said, we're going to pick you, me and my boy going to pick you up from the airport. And he, when he drove up to his apartment, he, he went to the, the box, he swiped his card. I'm in the back seat like, okay, I'm looking around, I see the gates open up. He drives through the gate. I see the swimming pool, the tennis court. I'm like, yo, we got a swimming pool. Yo, we got a tennis court. Gym. Yo, we ain't got nothing like this in New York. And then I get into his apartment. He showed me around his apartment. And what clenched it was he showed me his master bedroom, and there was a bathroom inside the master bedroom. And I was like, yo, you got a bathroom inside your bedroom? Yeah, a master oh, bathroom. I'm, I'm moving to Georgia. Because we don't have nothing like that in New York. I guess the only got, I mean, the thing is, New York, everything is vertical. Here, everything is spread vertical. it out. Yeah, but even if you got a house, there's no master, there's no no bathroom in a master in houses. You know, and yeah, because you, you got to come out like, you got to come out of your master bedroom to go to the hall bathroom. Oh, wow. So when, I, when I saw that, I was like, oh, man, I, be, I could be in my bedroom chilling, 
my girl could be in the living room with her, her friends. I never have to come out. I'm just I'm chilling. I ain't going nowhere. I got a bathroom go in my bedroom. Exactly. Go to the bathroom, come back in bed, watch TV. Oh, it's on. I'm living a life. And, and I promise you this, too. I bet you when you was looking at places and seeing the rent, you got twice the space for about half the price, right? Exactly. Like, what? Five and change for this? Two bedrooms, two bed. Oh, I'm definitely coming down here. Women pool, tennis court? Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Hey, absolutely. You're yeah. welcome. <laughs> yeah. Appreciate it, man. As you see, I ain't left. I've been here ever since. Hey, Boy, I'm loving I it. it. Loving it. I dig it. So you left Coke. You go back to music. Where do you plant your feet at that point? At that point, I was actually working for. You ever heard of Reverend Timothy Fleming? Yeah. I, he had a record label called God Strength Records, and I actually was on his record label doing PR. And I did that for about a year. And I'll, I'll tell you another story, too, as I'm thinking about Reverend Fleming. But um, at the time, I'm also doing some freelance writing for some magazines. Mm -hmm. So I call a friend of mine at Atlantic Records, and I say, hey, you got this artist. I'm writing for this magazine, and I would love to interview her. And my friend at the label said, well, you know what? She's going to be in Atlanta, uh, XYZ, let's say this weekend. I'm going to give you the number to the hotel. Her mom is going to answer the phone, and I'll let them know that you're going to call them to do the interview. So I said, cool. So that day, I'm sitting at the record label, at Reverend Fleming's label, and I I got my notes already. I got my, my words written out, what I'm going to ask this young lady. Her, call the hotel. Her mom picks up. Say, hey, this is such and such for such and such magazine. She said, okay, hold on one second. Let me get my daughter. Me and her daughter get on the phone. We start talking. We must have talked for at least a good hour. Probably 10 minutes into the conversation, I stopped taking notes. I mean, we're laughing and joking. Uh, what do you do? What do you like? I mean, it was like talking to an old friend. Mm. At the end of the conversation, she says, hey, you know, I'm performing tonight at Centennial Olympic Park. Why don't you come through? And I said, yeah, yeah, you know what? That's cool. I'm going to come through. That's great. I'll meet you backstage. Just come through and like that. I was like, cool. But as the night started getting over longer, I said, you know what? I'm all the way down here in Campbellton Road, and I live all the way in Gwinnett, for those that know Atlanta. Right. Man, that's a long ride back home. I'm just going to chill. You know what? I'll see her another time. Another time never came because it was Aaliyah. You stood up Aaliyah? Stood up Aaliyah, for real. Yeah. That's yeah. deep. <laughs> to, 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 to this day, let me tell you, I, I'm going to tell you something. To this day, I can't watch any of her videos or listen to any of her music. I just because it's just that that's how strong the conversation was. But then I have to tell myself. But and I and I've heard stories like that. She was just a real homegirl. Down to earth. Down to earth. But now what I have to think of it in a way is what if I would have went to backstage and hung out with her? We would have really connected. Not not on I'm not talking any romantic thing, but just like real friends. Friend. And right. she would have said, hey, you know what? I need you on my team. You got a music background. You work with this person, work with that person. I would love to have you on my team. And I could have been on the plane that day. Yeah, it's it's a lot of what ifs. Yeah. It's yeah. a lot of what ifs, you know. I mean, I've been stood up before, too, but it went by Leah. I know. <laughs> I know that's like, yeah, yeah. So you know, I got to it that way, man. I get stood up because it's Tuesday, but you know, <laughs> you get a chance to tell Aaliyah that, you know, I don't feel like it. I'm just going to chill today. I, you know, I'm thinking I'm, I'll see you another time, you know, when we connect another, but yeah, man. Uh, and I think about it, I could have been like, man, if I was on that, and I definitely would have been on that plane, no doubt. If right. I would have been hanging out with her, I definitely would have, you know, Fatima, uh, Fatima Robinson, excuse me, the choreographer was the only person out of the crew that said, I'll take another flight. Mm. And she's the one that actually choreographed the second coming to America. Right. Yeah. And, and that Rock the Boat video. And the Rock the Boat video, exactly. But she decided to take another flight. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah. crazy. Yeah. That's crazy, man. Like, like I said, it's so much history. 
so much history in this one man um one thing i have been looking at the whole time and you got to tell the people what's going on yeah i don't know if y'all noticed this over his left shoulder yeah those mm -hmm. are those are plaques people that's when you certify because you done did something appreciate it so so tell them by who you done worked with that they got hanging on your wall uh this is actually two of four the top one is uh sinead o'connor she did a record with MC Light. Wow. The bottom one is my participation for the record Self Destruction. Wait a minute, Self Destruction? Uh huh. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Uh, I mean, that, that just answers every question that I thought I had. Like, it's yeah. Self Destruction, man. Like,. <laughs> Yeah, that was a blessing. I I wound up working. Um, um, Light was part of the rec, part of the project. Yeah. And I used to go with Light to uh, the meetings for the record. And uh, at some point, Light, because of her schedule, she couldn't go to all the meetings that was talking about how to put the record together and everything like that. And so I used to go in her place, and really, you know, it was a blessing. I started to lend my voice. KRS One, Nelson George, a couple other people was there. Dwayne Taylor from Dive, and and was blessed with the the plaque. That's that's major. Um, wow, I'm. You know what? A, with that, I think that's where I uh I pack it up for the night, y'all, because yeah. that's that's real right there. Self destruction, probably one of the most iconic songs in hip hop. Yeah. You know, and you got a plaque for it that's yeah. that is major on so many levels so let me ask you this you know my last question for the night what you got going on now you just enjoy, enjoying the retired life or you still got your oh, feet man. in I, I, i'm sort of one foot in and one foot out at 56 you know well two things i'm doing three things i should say the first thing i still do a lot of public speaking uh the second thing and mainly sometimes on music but a lot of times on my disability Second thing is I'm a music consultant, so I have a couple of artists that I consult with on a monthly basis. I, you know, I just teach them the game of the business of, of the music industry. I do have a website called LearnTheMusicBusiness.com, uh, where I got a bunch of friends together from the industry, and they're giving tips about the uh, the music business. And then I've been with Legal Shield for about the last year and a half. Uh, Legal Shield basically allows uh people have access to a law firm for about 35 dollars a month because a lot of times when i'm talking to an artist and i'll say well who's your entertain who's your entertainment attorney if i'm talking to a producer or a manager who's your entertainment attorney a lot of them will say well i don't have one i can't afford it so i say hey let me hook you up for 35 dollars a month let me get you in touch with legal shield and they won't have access to one attorney they actually have access to a law firm so those are my three primary things right now that i do that's major that's truly major because i mean you've done everything i appreciate it man thank you you know what i'm saying it's like the only thing that i could think of you haven't done was i don't know run cross country and some white and red nikes yeah i haven't, <laughs> I haven't done that but but I've you have, out of airplane but i haven't run across country see the man jumps out of airplanes people oh uh, yeah man that was a there. Out oh, of yeah. yeah that was definitely dumb I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about doing it one more time one more time how many times have you jumped out this plane sir only only one but yeah it's it's, it's uh you know i'll tell you a funny story nat robinson the first priority music told me years ago that when he first jumped out of the plane like when i jumped out of the plane i got a guy on my back right tandem jumping and he'll tap me and put your arms out he'll pull the cord and everything but nat literally jumped out of the airplane wearing a helmet i still got and the camera on it Got a helmet on it, no camera, but they're talking in his ear, telling him when to pull the chute. And I'm like, there's no way I'm jumping out of an airplane with just by myself with a helmet on. Nah, no, no, no. in my ear. I got to have somebody on my back at least coordinating something. So Right, yeah. right. You yeah, know, exactly. tell, tell me which way to lean. And exactly, just, exactly. Right. Yeah, exactly. And he, he was trying to do, he was like, you know, clapping hands. I'm like, nah, nah, nah. I'm doing this. He's like, like sit down. Like clap your like, hands. I'm, like I am. <laughs> he was like, he was like, clap your hands, wave your hands. Like, no, 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 I'm good. I'm like, good. I did. Good. I did. <laughs> Yo, 
tell the people where they can find you on your social sites, websites, and just any way they want to reach out to you. Let them know how they can follow you. Very cool. I appreciate it. Follow me on uh, Instagram, Terry underscore Mora. Facebook, Terry dot Mora. Um, you can go to my website, terrymore.com. My legal website, T Mora, first initial, Mora.com. I always tell people, Google me, Terry Mora, music biz coach, and I'll pop up. Indeed, indeed. And you know, like seriously, we've hit the hour mark four minutes ago, on about five minutes ago at this point, and we still haven't scratched the surface. So it's like, oh, it's like you got to come back. We got to oh, do this again. Man, just let me know, man. I, I, I'm there, man. It's an honor. And I appreciate you, man, for inviting me, man. It's an honor to speak with you. Definitely, definitely. Yo, y'all know what it is, man. 1180 Sigmund Road. It's another Friday night at San Francisco Surfer Turf out in Conyers. Y'all come through and kick it. Also, voting season is upon us. Go to atlhottest.com right now. Vote for DJ Agony, ATL's hottest DJ club event DJ. We going for number three, y'all. I'm trying to hang three of them on the wall. You know what I'm saying? I could, I could uh, three-peat like Jordan and then walk off like this. You know what I'm saying? So, yo, atlhottest.com right now. Hottest club event DJ. DJ Agony himself. San Francisco Surfer Turf, 1180 Sigma Road. That's tonight. And, yo, uh, stay tuned and stay dope, man, because we still got so much going on. The, I know y'all tired of me saying this, but the YouTube is coming soon. Um, just as soon as I sit down and put it together. It, that's about where I am with it. <laughs> but, uh, yo, everybody that came through, like, share, comment, whatever. Big shouts out to DJ Conan. Big shouts out to Dana Dane. Yo, appreciate y'all for stopping through. And, um, as I end every show, imitation is a serious form of flattery that mediocrity could pay to greatness. Mm. Until the next time, stay dope, stay tuned. It's the God. Peace. Peace.